you see the, um, the topic we're going to be talking about? That means there's going to be a lot of silence in the room. <laughs> We, we want to talk about, about human sexuality, about Christian sexuality today, and, and we're very pleased to be able to do that. Um, my lovely, lovely wife is a wonderful partner. We've been married now for a little over 33 years and have enjoyed, uh, enjoyed one another. So um, let's go ahead and pray, and then we will get started. Father, we pray that you would put a hedge about us because this is a subject, Lord, that the devil has used to try and distort and destroy so many of us. And, oh, God, we just pray that, uh, that your spirit would be over us, that we might get your view of this beautiful uh, gift of sexuality. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get started, we know this is live streamed. Um, the content of this discussion is uh, definitely for teens and up. And so if you have small children in the room or if you have small children here, uh, we would ask that you would uh, please uh, help them to uh, uh, exit. So um, we, this is really for adults and um, if you are a child in spirit, as many of you all are, as we talk about this important subject, uh, you might want to stay around because we hope that you will grow up in our conversation here. So we have some basic questions to start with, and you, you don't mind if we interact with you, do you, while we're talking. So, so how many of you were taught about sex by your parents? Okay, now if anyone, if anyone sees, there is a, just maybe I can count on one or two hands the number of people who raise their hands. And so the question is why? Why were our parents uncomfortable talking with us about sex? What's that about? You know, we've gotten a message that somehow sex is dirty or sex is, you know, is to be kind of done be behind closed doors. You don't talk about it. And in not talking about it, what happens with our kids? It sets them up to learn about it elsewhere. So where did you learn about sex? Well, the kids. we want you to teach them, OK? So but, but where did you learn about sex? From school, a health, a health class in school, maybe, or from? Your friends or from a book you might have been given to read, you know, something, but not from your parents, not from your own family. So I want to ask you this question, those of you who have children, who do you want to teach your kids about sex? Who's going to give them a Christian view of sexuality, if not you? In fact, when was the last time you preached a sermon about sex? from the pulpit. And, and, you know, at Andrews in the seminary, we have, we have students from all over the world. And so when I talk about this, I understand cultural differences. I understand, you know, and so please filter this through your cultural context, but really try to listen and hear it because I think what God is trying to share with us transcends culture to a large degree. So, Absolutely. but we do understand you know, that there needs to be some caution in different cultures because if you talk too openly about it, you know, um, there could be some challenges you might face, so. But I want to say very strongly and very passionately that the devil has stolen this very important subject and, and really sh bathed it in a lot of shame. And so he has set the agenda for this very, very critical subject, as opposed to us as Christians. This is our subject. This belongs to us. 
And so I want to let you know as passionately as I can that we are committed wherever we go to, yes, there is a cultural context to it, but the truth is the truth is the truth. Yeah. And we want to really, uh, uh, the servant of the Lord says that we have to rescue uh, true from the trash heap of error. And so that's what we are seeking to do about this very, very important subject. And this is what I expect is going to happen. Some of you are going to dissociate. And what do I mean by that big word? I mean, you're going to clock out. You're going to laugh. You're going to giggle. You're going to turn to your partner. It happens all the time. When I talk about it in nursing classes, the students do it. When we talk about it in the seminary, the seminarians do it. Wherever we go, people get uncomfortable, and how that un discomfort is expressed is through this giggling, and, and I want to propose to you that we need to stand in the beauty of this truth as God has given it to us. So when you think about sex, Normally, you think about it in terms of biology, okay? The, the physical aspect of, of, of sex. For example, you know, if we, can, if we can talk about it openly, you know, sexual expression for most of us is when a husband and a wife come together and however, make love, have sex, you know, their bodies come together. That's what we think about in terms of sexuality. But I would like to suggest to you that that's just one small aspect of sexuality, that sexuality is much broader than that. But we tend to con con constrain it to simply the physiological part of it. But we need to look at the, the broader part of it because it is a par an essential part of our spirituality. In fact, biblically, I believe that sexuality and spirituality are so intimately connected with one another, and that's why Satan has tried to destroy it so much. Your sexuality cannot be divorced from your spiritual life. Because in the beginning, what were the two things that God created at creation? The two institutions. Sabbath and sexuality, marriage, okay? The two are intimately connected to one another. And so we need to understand that, that that is the truth that we're, that we're trying to recapture in its beautiful, beautiful form. So I wanna ask you this. Having said that, when does a person reach their sexual prime? When does a young man reach, when does a man reach his sexual prime? The peak of his sexual capacity. What age? Okay, dude. It's, it's, it's all right. It's all right. But uh, how about a woman? 35. How about a man? Come on, come on, come on. 20? Okay, okay. See, now, the answer to that question is primarily biological, your answers were biological, okay? But when you understand what sexuality is, that it's so much more than biology, that it's really intimacy and connection between two persons, not just two bodies. It's not just a penis being inserted into a vagina. It's not just the pleasure that comes from that, but it's about the intimacy and deep connections that only come from knowing a person, not just experiencing their body. When do you think that occurs? When you're married, that occurs many years after you have experienced one another. Because when you're on your honeymoon, hey, it's all about, it's all about the hormones, right? And that's as it should be. God, did God make sex for pleasure? Is sex a good gift? Yeah. Is sex the thing that, that, that connects us most with the creative potential of God? Yeah. Absolutely, it's good. The pleasurable part about it is good. But I want to tell you that there's so much more to it than that. That's, that's the opening, entering wedge. But that's not, it's like, it's like the cake 
well, it's like the icing on the cake, but it's not the cake itself, okay? So, so we, we, we want to normally reach, people reach their sexual prime when they're maybe in their 40s or 50s and they've experienced life with their partner, with their spouse for all those years. So, so again, is God a sexual being? Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> yeah, is God a sexual being? Um, by the way, I just want to backtrack a little bit. I believe that, you know, we know that Jesus is the door. He's the good shepherd and all of the imagery that we have of scripture in scripture about who uh, God is to us. But I believe the reason why the enemy has attacked this area, sexual, the sexual arena so, uh, so much and so intently, intensely is because this is uh, the best example of the closeness and, to intim and the intimacy that God wants to enjoy with us as his people. And so if he can pervert this, if he, if he could have us not talking about it, if he can have us shamed about it, then we miss out on the beauty of what God wants for us. And the flip side, I, I don't know if you have a question on there about this, David. You ask, when, are we, when do we reach our sexual prime? And I would like to ask, when do we become sexual beings? At birth? At, at, at birth, we, we become sexual, sexual beings. And conception? Okay. Uh, again, I, in terms of biology, we uh, certainly are, um, we have a gender that we, gender that we uh, uh, receive at birth. But, you know, I, I used to think um, very naively, and I'm sure many people have, is that, you know, when the hormones start raging at 12 or 13, that's when you become a sexual being. No, I'm being sexual right now. And so are you, by the you way. You are too. Again, we're trying to disconnect the, sex, uh, the sexuality from the sex act. The sex act is part of our sexuality, but it is not the entire experience. I am being sexual now, you are as well. So in what sense is God a sexual being? In what sense is God a sexual being? When you take a look at the Trinitarian relationality of God, is, is, the, is the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, intimately connected to one another? Are they open and transparent with one another? Is there any hiding between the members of the Godhead? Remember that when God created Adam and Eve, he made them in his own image. And they were what? Naked and unashamed. They were naked and unashamed of their sexuality. That's God's plan for biblical sexuality. And I'm not talking primarily about physical nakedness here. Nakedness is, I'm not going to hide anything about myself from you. And I don't want you to hide anything about yourself from me. That's modeling biblical sexuality and intimacy and connectedness from the very Godhead itself, being naked and unashamed. Unfortunately, when sin came into the world, what came with it? Shame, hiding, hiding from God, hiding from one another. And so we, we wanna, we, we're trying to advocate for a return to true biblical sexuality. So let's take a look at this. So how has Satan hijacked God's gift of sexuality? So we had, you know, why do you think people struggle to talk about it? Why did your parents not feel comfortable teaching you 
about it. Because we had, we have a lot of Victorian ideas that have come into, you know, that it's dirty, that it's nasty, that it's hidden. You know, we have people coming to talk to us who have never seen their wife or their husband's body, except in the dark or under the covers, okay? And there's that sexual shame, there's that discomfort talking about it. So when you look at yourself in the mirror after you've taken a shower in the morning, what do you see? Even more importantly, what do you say? My, 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 isn't this a fine specimen right here? <laughs> God couldn't have done anything better. Yeah. <laughs> or do you do the, oh, I'm fat, look at this roll. Or man, I'm, oh, ah, ah. You know how we do. That's part of sexual shame, not appreciating our bodies. You know, again, the world beats upon us and he sh shame upon us, and I would add sexual shame as well. And we have internalized it and have done the same thing. We say we're people of the book. We say we love the word of God, but we have internalized lies and believe that they're true. They're true lies. And the truth is that if, you know, if we are looking at ourselves and saying that God could have done better, what are we saying about him? God likes diversity. He likes big lips, nappy hair, straight hair, curly hair. He likes big stomachs. He likes fat thighs. He likes those things. It is all about diversity. He likes that. Can we join him in caring for our bodies? And maybe we do have too much weight. Well, you can do something about that. But we have these stereotypes about what the ideal man is, man is supposed to look like, you know, or the ideal woman. And, and so after a woman has babies and the body starts changing and with age, you know, men's bodies start changing too. And, you know, and we do get little tummies or whatever it is, but I have good news for you. When the rolls are called up yonder, <laughs> I'll be there. But you know, there, there's another aspect of this that's, that's problematic too in terms of what Satan has done. And that is, there's, there's the Victorian, don't talk about it, shame-based part, but then there is the, mo the modern, postmodern part where anything goes. And so we have this extreme or this extreme that Satan has, that Satan has used. So we have, you know, for example, if you took, take a look at surveys, research on Christian men, how many, what percentage of Christian men view pornography? If you take a look, it's, the research shows between 60 and 70 percent. I did a survey of NAD pastors um, recently in some of their challenges, and about a third were willing to admit it, that they struggle with pornography. Okay? And they were probably under-reporting, to be honest with you. They were probably under-reporting. You know, um, there have been pastors' meetings where, where pastors have been discovered together looking at pornography together, okay? And so just be aware that Satan has tried to, to counterfeit because he knows that this is so close to, to God. Our sexuality is so close to God. And so, and so we need to really um, not go to either extreme of shame or or, or this tremendous anything goes mentality, but maintain, you know, that's why we're trying to capture this beautiful, beautiful picture of sexuality. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. So, um, and so at first, you know, in God created intimacy with himself between Adam and Eve, with himself, and then 
between the man and the woman in marriage. So, so I want to ask you this. Um, what is your understanding about, um, about having sex, being intimate on the Sabbath? You know, remember Isaiah chapter 58, not doing your own pleasure on the Sabbath day. A lot of us have been taught. How many of you were taught that based upon that verse, you don't do it on the Sabbath because you're doing your own pleasure? Okay. But, but, when, but when creation came, you know, on the seventh day, you know, sixth day, Adam and Eve were, you know, were made. And on the seventh day, they did what? Okay, so on the seventh day, they certainly rested, but, but what does rest mean? Well, you know, rest is more than, than taking a nap, okay? You know, rest is an experience of God. In fact, Sabbath is an experience of God, of the deepest intimacy with God and the deepest intimacy with your spouse as well as with your church family, okay? And the deepest intimacy with God, I would suggest to you, is a sexual intimacy, a knowing God, not just not just knowing about God, Elder Falkenberg, but, but knowing God. And, and, so, and so when you look at Jewish tradition, Friday night was the night for sex. You know, you talk to any rabbi, they'll tell you that is the day that God has blessed and sex is going to be better that day than any other day. I'm, I'm being for real from experience, okay? That it's, it's, it is the best day to enjoy this deep, connected intimacy with God, with one another, okay? So, so let's define sexuality, okay? So I'm, I'm just going to read this real quickly. The constitution of, individu of an individual in relation to sexual attitudes or activity. This is a broad concept that includes aspects of physical, psychological, social, emotional, and spiritual makeup of an individual. All of those things. In other words, it's all encompassing. Every part of you is sexual. That's how Beverly and I can say that right now you are being sexual. Because it's always, a, you're never not sexual. Okay? It is not limited to the physical or biological reproductive elements and behavior, but encompasses the manner in which individuals use their own roles and relationships and values and customs and gender. So, so when you think about yourself as a male and the, and the roles that go along with being a man or a male or a female and what goes along with being a female, I mean, right now, men are dressed differently than women, right? You can distinguish between this precious, beautiful woman and her husband, I'm assuming, so. Okay, 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 okay. So, you know, you gotta ask, you know what I'm saying? So, and so, but you're always expressing your femininity or your masculinity, you know, that's always a part of who you are. And when you, when you carry yourself and when you, when you, when you speak, you're speaking through that lens of, of, of your sexuality, okay? And so, and just think about this in terms of our conversation with uh, uh, single people. Uh, single men and women are sexual. And again, since we are a, a broadening the definition, it does not mean physical or biological only. Single people are, are being sexual as well. And I would like to suggest that single individuals can have deeply intimate and uh, rewarding and fulfilling 
relationships apart from the physical or biological aspect. You can be physically, I'm sorry, you can be emotionally available and free and open and be in relationship with someone. That can be a sexual experience as opposed to the narrow definition of how we've always seen sexuality. And so we can't tell a single people, you can't be sexual until you get married. Ed, wrong answer. The truth is we are always sexual. And I love that. And we, we really love when we talk about this wherever we go, when this, we do this talk. It's like, wow, that is so awesome because that means I can enjoy deeply fulfilling relationships. And what if God calls me to a life of singleness? Does that mean I can't enjoy deeply intimate relationships? No, it does not. It simply means that you need to understand, of course, the boundaries, the physical or the biological aspects are not yours to enjoy, but every other aspect of our sexuality can be free to be expressed. And so sexual shame is a visceral feeling of humiliation and disgust toward one's own body and identity as a sexual being and a belief of being abnormal, inferior, or unworthy. And so uh, how many of us carry sexual shame? I can, you know, when, I, when we first started talking about this, I, I teach a class uh, in the seminary on human sexuality a whole semester. And, and, and when I first started talking about some of this, I would get red in the face. So what does that mean? I would, I would feel embarrassment about it, right? That, would, that was an evidence of sexual shame, that it's uncomfortable talking about it, because I too was never taught about sex by my parents. And so and, you know, I was carrying that shame that somehow there's something wrong with this, and so I had to grow to overcome that you know, as a part of my as a part of my own ability to teach us. So this leads us to not want to talk about sex openly, but indirectly, and to te not to teach our children about holy sexuality, the reflection of God's relational intimacy with us. So, and so, um, we want to use the sanctuary as a model for sexuality, okay? So as we're doing that, we're, we're starting in the outer court, you know, the outer court, holy place, most holy place, right? So first of all, is there sexuality outside the sanctuary? We're defining the sanctuary as sexuality in the context of marriage. That's the biblical, would you agree that that's the biblical definition, you know, in the context of marriage? Okay, except for, you know, the single part, but, but in terms of the physiological, biological part. Okay, so, 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 in, in the context of marriage, we said that sex is made for pleasure, among other things, right? So, fellas or gals, how many of you feel free to say to your spouse... Wait a minute, before you ask that question. I know you love asking that question. I do. <laughs> Let, let me just say that again, uh, just to clarify. So, you know, the outer court had a uh, the white linen curtain around it that signified that was the the area, the holy area, and then there was a holy place and a most holy place. And so, I, I want to just lift up Jesus here first before you ask mm -hmm. this hard question, and that is in the outer court. I came to the outer court because I knew that I needed grace. So I'm a sinner and I am of the tribe that was parked on the west side of the gate and I had to walk all the way around to the east side of the gate with my lamb and everybody was talking about me and everybody knew I was going to the sanctuary for the umpteenth time this week bringing my lamb but I'm coming because I know I am in need of grace. I am in need of something. I need something. And so I am coming to the outer court. Christ is my savior. There you have it. All right. <laughs> Likewise, how many of you feel free to say to your spouse, baby, tonight I need some? <laughs> but did, 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 did you get their permission to be that frank? Did, did you ask him if we could be that frank? Um, I'm just asking. I'm asking for a friend. Go ahead, honey. <laughs> uh, and, and the reason why, again, did you hear the little laugh we did there? 
you know, the discomfort, you know, how many of you all can talk about that? How many of you all can say, I, I need you tonight. I want some tonight. And, and you don't have to answer out loud. Just think for yourself, you know, how many of you all can comfortably say that and not feel any way about it? Instead, what we tend to do if we're uncomfortable um, with that, you know, with asking very openly, if, we, if we're carrying sexual shame, we tend to be indirect in the way we ask. For example, we might cook a nice meal, you know, you know, to kind of do the foreplay thing, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll, or we'll, do the, we'll do the dishes, or we'll do something that's not typically what we would do so that she gets the message, yeah. baby, I want some tonight, yeah. okay. So, or, or sometimes, sometimes you just have the look. See, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> You just have the look. Or sometimes it's just a position in bed. You know, and she sees you. It's like, okay, I feel you, brother. <laughs> you know, and, and so just think about your sexual language or lack of it. Sometimes it's more through body language than it is through open expression, right? And so, you know, and so I would challenge us to get to the point, to grow to the point of being comfortable with our own sexuality so that we can express that openly without, without sexual shame, okay? Without sexual shame. You see, those of us who are adults, we tend to be the ones who carry more sexual shame than the younger generation. They're much more open about it. We need to catch up, in a sense, but make it holy so that they can learn that aspect of it from us, not th the shame part of it that we're carrying. So, And so it's OK to say, I need some. And I would suggest that, again, as we are describing, our, our metaphor is the sanctuary is the, uh, the institution of marriage. Uh, and likewise, uh, there are sex outside of the sanctuary. Is that appropriate? What would be examples of sex outside the sanctuary? Adultery, yes, what else? Yes, promiscuity, sex before marriage, uh, pornography. Those are all uh, uh, items of sex outside the sanctuary. But when you come into the confines of this sanctuary, the holy place, I mean, the holy um, grounds in the outer court, uh, again, there is a need. And in, in our, our, our language that we'll be using as, as we progress through the sanctuary, there's a very appropriate place for outer court sexual experience. And that would be when you get married. You know, you have sex two, three, four times a week, uh, first couple years, or uh, first year, or first six months, or first week. You know, whatever your experience was. Um, you know, you, and, and that's very appropriate. There's nothing wrong with it. Remember, it's in the confines of the marriage uh, experience. And so uh, personal pleasure, you're enjoying one another. Uh, you know, our focus is uh, on getting the best orgasm we can have. That's great. That's very appropriate in outer court sex. So I'm wondering how many of you use scripture as a part of your foreplay? Help us, Lord Jesus. Okay, so, so here we go, here we go. How many of you have used the Song of Solomon? For example, how beautiful are your sandaled feet, O queenly maiden. Your rounded thighs are like jewels, the work of a skilled craftsman. Your navel is a perfectly formed, like a goblet filled with mixed wine. Between your thighs lies a mound of wheat bordered with lilies. Your breasts are like two fawns. 
twin fawns of a gazelle, your neck as beautiful as an ivory tower, and so forth. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, how beautiful you are. How pleasing, my love. How full of delights. You are slender like a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree and take hold of its fruit. <laughs> now, now, this is the word. I'm serious. We tend to think that this is an analogy between Christ and his church and all that kind of, and, and I, I don't argue with that, but it's also deeply, deeply human, personal stuff. And, and we, we can be using this. Yes. Okay. Yes. How about, how about uh, another silly question? How many of you all pray before you have sex? <laughs> That's most holy place. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. We're, we're, we're going to get there. Okay. We're going we're gonna to get there. Okay. You know. Okay. We're, we're going to help a brother out and help a sister out here in just a little bit, okay? Okay, but, okay, so I want to ask you this question. When you have an orgasm, are your eyes open or closed? Just think about it for a second. If your eyes are closed, where's your focus? I didn't, I didn't hear that part, but... But if your eyes are closed, isn't your focus on your sexual organ and having the very best, most pleasure you can have? Whether you're male or female, is there anything wrong with that? Having the best orgasm you can have, is there anything wrong with that? No. However, there's a danger that comes with it, and that's the danger of, of, of objectifying your spouse. Okay. There are many women who have come to talk to us who've said this. They've said, you know what? I feel like a married prostitute. You know, my husband, it's, it's the wham, bam, thank you, ma'am kind of thing. You know, all he's interested is, is coming, and then he rolls over and goes to sleep. He's not interested in me. And so if we only stay in the outer court, pleasure-focused aspect of sexuality, the danger is objectification. It's using your spouse for your pleasure only. However, listen to me, researchers have shown this, that the vast majority of couples stay right here throughout their marriage. It's all about the pleasure. Okay? It's all about the pleasure, where orgasm is the goal. And, and, and this is evidence of poor differentiation, which mean, and differentiation means that I don't have a solid sense of who I am apart from you. If you like me, then I'll like me. In other words, we're, 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 we're um, exhibiting ex the need for external validation. Okay, and so let me just give you another example of that. You're, you preached your heart out in a great sermon. I mean, you prepared and prepared. You preached it, you know, and you, you, you were obedient to God. And, you know, you're standing out, outside the door greeting people after the sermon. And, and a lot of people are saying, oh, that was great, Pastor. And, and someone comes and says, that was an awful sermon. Who do you believe? Does it devastate you when someone doesn't like your sermon? That's evidence that you're poorly differentiated, that you don't have a solid sense of who you are and that you know that, you, that, that you're okay apart from what someone else thinks of you. That's so important. But a lot of people, when they stay here, that's evidence of poor differentiation. By the way, um, challenges in marriage with sex are usually evidence of, of relationship challenges outside the bedroom, where we're not talking to each other, we're not resolving conflict well, you know, 
And so what happens in the bedroom is really a reflection of the larger relationship. So really be, be very aware of that. Okay, so next is, is um, the friendship piece. Christ as my friend. So I've moved from the, from the outer court. I've, I've off, brought my offering, and the, pre, the priest takes my, the blood and moves it into the holy place. And in this, I recognize that, boy, I have a friend in Jesus. At last, I have been, uh, um, we are resolved. There's no conflict between us. We are at peace between each other. And there is a friendship that I know that God loves me and he loves, and I love him. So there's this friendship as we move closer and closer into the most holy place. And so in the most holy, in the holy place, I'm not just making love to a body, I'm making love to a person. And this person is my best friend. And so I'm sharing myself with my best friend. And so I'm not just sharing my body as we make love, I'm sharing myself and she's sharing herself. It's two people, two friends who are deeply intimate and deeply connected to one another. And so here, there's always um, our, our sex is person focused, and it's the wonder of this other person who's always growing and learning. And so are you the same person today that you were yesterday? If you're connected with the Holy Spirit, you're going to be always growing, changing, learning new things. And, and, and there's a wonder of that. And so how many times do we take our, our spouse for granted? I know him, I know his habits, I know what he does. You know, tell him about the birthday thing. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, I do know him very well. Uh, just a real quick, quick story. We, we worked at Weimar for uh, a period of time and while we were there, uh, David had a milestone birthday. And so he's very difficult to trick and so I decided, um, I was going to have a breakfast birthday. And so I sent the word out, you know, sent invitation out, invitations out. And you know, uh, Weimar ha is like a compound. So the workers live on, we uh, on the campus. And so I sent the word out. And I said, listen, uh, you, you have to come to my house at uh, 6.15. And they said, well, will David be up? I said, listen, this is the drill. David's going to get up. He's going to go into the shower about five minutes to six. And at about 6.15, 6, 6, 6, 6.20, he's going to be coming out of the shower. And this is when he had hair. I said, he, either he's going to be combing his hair or putting on his belt. And they said, are you sure? And they, I said, listen, I'm telling you the man's going to do that. And so they were, okay, you know, we're not going to say anything. Absolutely not. And so on the morning of the, of the birthday, sure enough, David got up at his appointed time, went to the shower, and all my friends came in. And, you know, we hurried and set up the table and everything. And at 6, I have a picture of this. He's coming out of the bathroom, combing his hair. And they were like, I can't, you were so right, absolutely. I know this man. I know his routines. I know what he's going to do. And so that's the knowing that David's talking about. We have routines. David knows my routines. He knows my look, what, what that look means, and how I'm acting, and all of that. He knows. So, uh, But baby, I'm a man of mystery. Yeah, that's what he tells me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> But you know, we, we get into sexual routines too, where we do the same thing the same way all the time, and, and there's no variety or change in the way that we do it. And, and we need to be able to use, you know, the Bible. We need to use other, other kinds of things that, that, that kind of make things a little bit more spicy and interesting, you know, um, when we're being sexual as well. So. And so let's, let's go to the most holy place, okay? Now, the most, in the most holy place, it was, it was one day a year, the most holy place of the sanctuary. And what was, what was that about? What was that about, that one day a year? Atonement, okay, which was cleansing the sanctuary from sin. 
okay? But it was also about at one meant with God. In other words, when sin is cleansed, we are one totally. We have recaptured this total intimacy and connection with God. That's the ideal, right? And so this was, this was a type once a year of this deep, deep connection and intimacy with God. And I'd like to suggest to you that in our, in our sexual expression, this is where God wants to take us to an encounter of our God lover. Okay, this is true intimacy and connection, not just between two friends, two best friends, as it is in the holy place, but it's true intimacy and connection with two people and God. Now, if we have a lot of sexual shame, we don't see God coming into that experience with us because, you know, it's like it's one of those things where the angels stay out of the room and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But we're suggesting, no, no, no. We want to invite God into this experience with us so that our intimacy and connection is also with him. That means sex becomes an act of worship. And what is Sabbath about, folks? Worship. Okay? Sex becomes, is an experience of God and us together. It's like two people coming together and you get lost in the other. You don't know where you begin and where they begin. And, of course, God is in the mix. And back to my question about, you know, have you prayed and asked God, uh, God, I want to have an orgasm. I want to I have one that's just going to be a wall socket kind of experience where, you know, there's electricity flying. I want to enjoy my husband. And I'm so glad you're here with me as opposed to, you know, he's, the angels veil their faces because they don't want to be there with us. No, we're here together as one in relationship with God. And so few of us experience that because of the sexual shame, because of our own hangups. Uh, we struggle to think that we can be so intimate with one another as well as with God. I remember when I first got married as we're winding down here, uh, my mother said, you know, you can't tell a man everything. You know, you got to keep some things to your, you know, to yourself. You got to keep things over to, you, gotta, you can't tell them everything. And that was manifested by, I'd buy something and I'd put it in the back of the closet. And then a month later, I'd pull it out and David said, I've never seen that. And I said, oh, I've had this thing. Anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about? Am I by myself? Am I by myself? Okay. Okay. And so, oh, I've had this for a, a minute and lying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so I remember one time the Lord told me just as plain and I stopped doing this. You are when you're trying to hide from David, you're hiding from me. And so it, it's so true. I'm hiding from God thinking I'm hiding. I'm sorry, hiding from David and I'm really hiding from God. And so in this sex experience, it is where we become one and God is part of it. You know, when we talk to singles, we don't say a half plus a half equals a whole. You're looking for your other half. Uh, wrong answer. It's one plus one equals one. And in a sex act, it is one plus one plus one equals one just this lostness in one another that is most holy sex that is worship that God would have us to enjoy and so as we are, are winding down here I want you to think about um, you know how do you present sex to your your congregation how do you present sex how do you carry out the sex act in your own life and we want to encourage you yes encourage you let's grab this conversation back from the enemy and have conversations among our, our parishioners among ourselves about what God is trying to do to restore this wonderful gift in its proper place I think, do we have three minutes here? Two minutes? Okay. So I want to I read this from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 3. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Isn't that interesting? 
Okay. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Okay? So, so what are the principles that, that 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 3 to 5 tell us? That we have sexual needs, right? that we shouldn't withhold from one another, okay? Well, I'm mad at you, so I ain't giving you any tonight. You know, is that, is that of God? No. But how many of us use sex as a weapon? You know, this great gift that God has given us, we use it as a weapon against one another. The Bible says don't do that. Don't, don't use it as a weapon. Don't withhold. Now, this does not mean that, on the other hand, I can force, you know, the Bible says, don't deprive me, therefore, I'm going to take whatever I want from you. No, that's when, this is not permission for, for rape in marriage or for using force in marriage. No, 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 no. Okay? But it is this holy agreement between husband and wife to not deprive, you know, we have needs, and so we're going to, we're going to, um, we're going to use those, we're going to fulfill each other's needs comfortably. So, so again, th it's important that we, we find ourselves um, in God's, in, God's uh, in harmony with God's will regarding this wonderful gift of sexuality. So anything you want to say by closing, sweetie? No? No, I want, them, I, I want you to worship tonight, though. <laughs> no. No. How about on your break this afternoon? <laughs> because Sabbath will be closed this evening after dark, right? Okay. So do enjoy. Do worship. Let's keep the Sabbath. And keep it holy. 